Okay, ready to kick off. Hello. Look at the new two here. Go back. Stick to the back. Okay. Speak and tag? No. Hold on, what the fuck? Yay. Yeah. This is all part of the plan, you know. Okay, Michael, right. spec attack number. What the fuck? <laughs> spec attack number 22. A big applause. <laughs> <Good. laughs> I think we, I don't know. Guys, we tried everything to make an event tonight. There were so many troubles. Actually, three people from Spec and Tech are in, in Silicon Valley, San Francisco right now. Probably they're watching the video live. Yeah. As you might notice, I'm not Julio. Yeah. <laughs> Julio upgraded. He got 20 centimeters. Not bad. Uh, yes, but yeah, we are here finally. Uh, Spec and Tech number 22, if you think it's working, called the Insert Coin. The name uh, meant something, and actually we were talking about gaming. Uh, we will have two fantastic... <sighs> We will have three fantastic speakers tonight. The first one, Giuseppe. Is he here in the first? No, it's fine. <laughs> it's you. The first one. <laughs> the first one. The first one sitting here in the foot. Oh. Okay. The first one sitting here in the first row, Giuseppe Longo. Big applause. An even bigger applause for the fact of uh, living from let's say this from Bari this morning. <laughs> living from Bari this morning at 4:55, and arriving this afternoon in Trento, and leaving tomorrow morning to go back to the south of Italy. So another big applause for. Us. And then you have just one speaker, but two. And the first one is Giovanni Frigo, the CTO of Velka. Uh, where are you, Giovanni? Like, ah, here we are. Applause. And then, always from Velka, Massimo Frasson is waving from outside. What the fuck? Massimo, come out. Come in. <laughs> and applause for him as well. Okay, their talk will be about Unity, so if you're interested in uh, Unity, they actually launched uh, a Unity user group in Trento. There are several guys here, if you can raise your hands. Yeah, look at them. Uh, they're actually the guys uh, running the, the Unity user group. Uh, you can follow their page on Facebook and their group. We will support them uh, as spec and tech, so check them out. Uh, it's always nice when you see local communities and things uh, running in Trento. Okay, our supporters, Word to Michele. Yeah, so first of all, we have to thank you, uh, to say thank you to Impact Up Trentino, which is uh, the place we're in right now. They always uh, provide the space for our events, so we have uh, to thank them very much. Then we have uh, EAT Digital and Belka. Uh, EAT Digital is a company, well, the institution uh, that uh, Francesco is working for. <coughs> Belka is, uh, well, tonight providing us speakers and generally supporting us with the time of uh, their employees that are Spec and Tech volunteers. Otherwise, probably we speakers. Yep. Then we have uh, GitHub, Cloudflare, Ignite. <coughs> uh, that are sending us wonderful stickers. We have Faturing Cloud, which is, which is the software we use uh, to make all the receipts for legal and fiscal reasons. Diginate especially uh, always provides us with uh, personalized Spec and Tech speakers, uh, stickers, so that you can have if you go there and donate at the at the entrance of the room. You can have one of these wonderful stickers. And also, if you want uh, some more uh, Spec and Tech swag to uh, help uh, spread the brand uh, in, every, in every part of the world, we still have uh, a few uh, t-shirts in some sizes. Women? Yeah, mostly women's sizes, yes. We're almost out of the uh, 2017 edition of the t-shirt, and we are working on the 2018 edition. So, stay tuned. 
Also, we have to say a big thank you to Segata, which is our main, first and main sponsor, providing us with uh, all the spec uh, that, we, uh, that we give out uh, at our events. So, later you will have uh, the possibility to try their amazing spec and cold cuts and cheese and everything. Uh, as always, if you want to be updated on our events, uh, just uh, check on our website. We have all the issues there with all the previous events, the talks, the speakers, the supporters, the people that were there attending, also the reviews, and the, you can actually review all the events uh, via the Facebook videos, and as well also the albums with the photos of the night. And uh, yeah, just uh, put a like on our page or follow our Telegram channel. We are like 557 people inside that, like pretty impressive and growing. Um, otherwise, you want to be more engaged and not just receive stuff, but also create stuff. You can join our Telegram channel, uh, our Slack team. Uh, you can actually go to this uh, URL. We are over 200 people over there. And you can just shoot a message saying, uh, I want to build uh, this new feature, I want to create a new website, I want to design something. There's this cool conference uh, in the next month uh, who's attending and so on. There are some nice things happening inside there, just uh, populated. Yeah, so one of our uh, frequently asked questions is, do I have to donate? If you're regular to these events, you already know. Uh, if, you're, if it's the first time for you, the answer to do I have to donate is, uh, it depends. You don't have to donate, it's not mandatory. But if you want to support these events and to make them happen again, we highly appreciate your donation. We have uh, costs, uh, you know, we have beers uh, that, uh, that we buy for you. Uh, we have uh, administrative costs, uh, we pay like uh, the trip uh, for our speakers to come. So if you want these events to uh, continue and to get bigger, we highly appreciate your donations. Plus? Plus, oh yes, of course. If you donate, uh, you can enter a raffle to win uh, three JetBrains li licenses for any product in their suit for one year. So uh, if you're interested, uh, when, you, when you donate, just, uh, just ask uh, for the ticket to enter the raffle. Anyway. And uh, yeah. Stay tuned later for the spec. I would say we have uh, specs. We have beer uh, is already is already out. Just uh, go ahead and take it, and later we'll have spec uh, and uh, everything else. Yeah, almost ready to fly. Uh, get ready for enjoy the night. Uh, since we're talking about gaming, we actually have two intros by um, two nice uh, speakers and personalities of our, of our uh, industry. I would say. Um, first of all, as you may may be aware. We are actually part of the official program of the Trento Film Festival, the biggest festival about the movies uh, on mountains. So if you actually check here on, at page 30 something, 30 let me check five. it out. Yeah, look at that. Look at that, 35, there's uh, Spec and Tech. Yeah. Ooh, what an honor. Yeah, so we're really proud of being published over that nice book with a lot of interesting events. It brings people from all over Europe, especially all over Italy. Uh, interesting in films, in especially like a very nice culture films uh, and people about interested about mountains. Um, here we have uh, this event is, spo is sponsored and uh, supported by Trentino Film Commission, who is one of the organizers of the Trentino Film Festival. And we have Alberto Patocchi here to say a few words. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, Francesco, thank you. thank you for inviting uh, me. And uh, uh, tonight, uh, my name is Alberto Battocchi, I work for Trentino Film Commission. And uh, tonight I would like you to bring you a uh, salute from uh, uh, my institution and, uh, and from uh, the Trento Film Festival. So I speak on behalf of the two institutions. Okay, for, for who is not familiar with uh, what a film commission is, is a public body that uh, uh, gives uh, logistic and economic support to uh, uh, film projects, especially film projects that want, uh, pro film productions that want to uh, um, produce their projects here in, uh, in Trentino. And um, why we are invited at an event that um, uh, deals with um, Video games, because uh, since the last year, with a new law in Italy, um, video games uh, are uh, considered part of um, uh, audiovisual 
um, of, of uh, are considered as a audiovisual um, kind of project. So um, uh, video games can benefit of the same kind of uh, support, financial support from public bodies as um, film projects and documentaries uh, traditionally do. So um, this uh, created a, a big change in the in the environment because developers, game developers, can now uh, have access, access to uh, a, a totally new uh, kind of um, uh, funds that uh, previously previously were not available to them, and uh, this created a big turmoil in the environment. And um, our first partner, um, since, since we um, since the law was uh, approved, uh, we as the Tino Film Commission decided to um, respond to it by. Um, creating a project which is called Trentino Game Box and uh, which is in, uh, in uh, its development phase at the moment and uh, this project aims, I, may, as I know that some of you are already involved, I, uh, for those who are not involved and uh, maybe are interested, I'm here tonight, we can talk about that and uh, there, we, there is a, um, a Facebook uh, group you can join, Trentino Game Box and uh, this project uh, aims at uh, creating an environment of uh, um, game developers uh, working in Trentino or maybe coming, willing to come to Trentino. And uh, the idea is to provide them uh, funds and uh, logistic support also from Trentino Sviluppo, which is an agency of the province that also has some um, uh, measures uh, of support for um, companies. Uh, so um, this is this is why I'm here, just to tell you that uh, if anybody is, is interested in, in this kind of project, uh, uh, we are ready to listen. But our uh, I would like um, you to introduce you to um, uh, a very important partner we have uh, since. Um, since uh, video games were a totally new environment to us, we would like to, uh, we decided to partner up with a, an institution which is ISV, which is the uh, um, the Italian Association of Game Developers and uh, Publishers, right? And uh, because uh, they are one of the main names in in the environment in Italy, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce to you. Uh, um, Giorgio Catania uh, from from ISP, uh, who is uh, who was with us today in a long day of meetings about <laughs> video games here in uh, in Trento during the film festival, and uh, he was so kind to join us for to, for tonight. Okay, so uh, a big applause to Giorgio Catania. Francesco, it's uh, an honor to be here, and uh, sorry for my rusty English, uh, I will try to explain myself. Uh, first of all, uh, I am uh, Giorgio Catania, Developer Relations Manager at ISV, uh, which is uh, the association of the video game industry in Italy, and uh, I am a video gamer, uh, a lot of Game Over can prove it. Uh, however, you know, what is ISV? ISV is the association of the video game industry, as I told you. And um, we have uh, a lot of members inside ISV, which are uh, console manufacturers uh, like uh, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, publishers uh, like uh, Activision Blizzard, uh, Ubisoft, uh, uh, Warner Bros. Entertainment, and uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of developers, Italian developers. Uh, which came from uh, all the all the country, and um, the the aim of the association is to promote and uh, represent uh, the video gaming industry in front of the institutions, uh, in front of the media and uh, the public, and uh, we do that uh, in many ways. Uh, first of all, uh, um, we talk. Uh, with the institution every day, and uh, we work at the, for the approval of the uh, legislation, sorry, for the cinema law, 
um, which uh, includes also uh, the, um, the funds and the tax credit for the audiovisual industry, uh, which um, includes also the video game industry. And uh, this uh, is a, a big uh, achievement uh, uh, for uh, the industry itself. Uh, because uh, that means that uh, the developers and the, um, the studio will grow up uh, m more in the next years. And uh, uh, however, uh, we have uh, more than uh, 50 uh, members uh, that are uh, Italian developers in ISV, uh, from all the countries, as it said. And um, ISV is uh, the promoter of uh, two of the main events, video game events in Italy. The first uh, is Milan Games Week, maybe you know that. It's the main uh, fair in Italy about video games. And uh, every year we had uh, a lot of uh, uh, visitors, uh, not the aliens, but uh, <laughs> uh, people. Uh, last year we had uh, 150,000 uh, attendees uh, in, uh, in the event, and we had uh, nearly 50 uh, video game uh, developers which showed uh, their, uh, their video games, their wonderful video games. And uh, we are also the promoter of uh, the Italian Video Game Awards, the awards uh, which uh, aim to uh, spread the consciousness of the video game as a cultural product, not only an, an entertainment product. And uh, what can I say about uh, the industry in Italy? Uh, 2017 has just ended, but uh, it represented a very wonderful year for the industry because uh, uh, a lot of important video games were published, like Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle, uh, which consecrated Ubisoft Milan as uh, an international studio uh, with a uh, um, fantastic creative director uh, like uh, Daniel Soliani. Um, there were, it was published also last day of June, uh, uh, the last video game of, uh, of Sonico, uh, which is an example uh, of a game beyond entertainment. And uh, Milestone published a lot of video games uh, and uh, it represents one of the most important uh, developers of uh, the racing games genre. Um, so, the industry is uh, growing. Uh, there are, uh, uh, from uh, last, uh, last uh, chances, uh, we we identified more than 120 uh, studios all around the country, uh, which uh, every year uh, creates a lot of uh, interesting video games. And uh, the institution is uh, supporting us uh, uh, more often than in the last years. And uh, what about uh, the Italian video gamers? Uh, we can say that uh, there are uh, a lot of video gamers, uh, uh, more than uh, 70 million of gamers uh, around Italy, and they are not only uh, kids, but are also uh, <laughs> also um, adults from uh, we can say 25 uh, till uh, 45 uh, years old, and uh, there are a lot of uh, gaming parents. We can say the first. Uh, um, uh, uh, generation of uh, of parents who are also video gamers and uh, are um, are playing uh, more often with their kids and uh, they are um, uh, are passing on uh, their uh, their hobby uh, their love for video games and uh, they um, they are growing their child with uh, uh, biggest knowledge about uh, the medium, uh, with a more <laughs> consciousness about which video games to play. And, uh, however, uh, uh, the uh, market in Italy has a turnover of uh, 1.5 billion euros, 
So it's uh, the fourth or fifth, or fifth uh, country in Europe. Uh, it's a big market that is growing year after year. So maybe some of you are gamers. Which of you maybe you can... Uh... <laughs> Don't be shy, please. <laughs> 50% so I can assume. So um, we can say that uh, Italian are uh, uh, are, uh, are gamers. Uh, how many of you plays FIFA? <laughs> That's strange because usually FIFA is the most uh, played games in Italy, but it's not a problem. However, uh, the aim uh, of ISV is to support the video game industry and uh, permit the, the growth of the, of the studios, all the studios in the country. And uh, if you need to know anything else about the association, about the industry, about the publisher, or everything you want to know, you can ask me. I will stay here. Uh, for a couple of hours, so um, please let me know. And uh, thank you to be here, and uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, have a nice evening. Hey. After the institutional salutes, I guess we can pass the torch <laughs> to the major of uh, Trentino. No, I'm joking. It's time for the here we are, Giuseppe Longo, a.k.a. Miss Bug, right? A big applause. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, I apologize in advance for my English, but has they were saying before, I endured a long journey in order to be here. And also, when I arrived here, I asked for a glass of water. They gave me beer. So uh, the doors of perception are now opened. Um, so thanks to them also for inviting me and uh, letting, letting me talk about uh, video games, game art, and in a way also game design. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Longo. Uh, I'm also known as Misbug in the video game development community. And I've been working in the video game industry for the last 10 years, roughly. And, well, here you have some of the titles I've worked on during the last few years. Um, I've been an employee for Nitrum and other companies, but I mainly work as a freelance and I do 3D graphics, the vector graphics, but I'm mostly known for pixel art. Uh, here you have some of the things that I do for living. Uh, as you can tell, uh, I like to push some details into my illustration, but I mainly like to start my uh, graphics starting from simple shapes, few colors, uh, very basic stuff. And this is something that I learned from what I was doing before uh, working in the video game industry. I was working as a graphic designer. I was make, making logos, uh, brand identities, and printable stuff and stuff like that. And I learned a lesson from that period. And I tried to transfer that lesson uh, to my new job. Uh, basically, I learned that when we create graphics, we are basically trying to express an information to the viewer. So we are creating a visual language, which is not that different from a verbal language, but instead of using letters and words, we use shapes and colors. In a verbal language, we have, for instance, H-O-U-S-E. Those letters mean nothing to you if they are alone. If you arrange them, you get the word house. 
So you get the concept and the information of the house. The same thing happens with shapes, a square, a triangle, a circle, an octagon, a rectangle, they are meaningless alone. But if we arrange them, as the letters create the word house, we can create with a square and a, a triangle a house. The circle in a certain context becomes the sun or the moon or whatever, and the octagon uh, signpost sim sitting on the thin rectangle. So, um, a visual language is really, building a visual language is really important for creating a certain design of a graphics. Among these shapes, there is one in particular which is really important to me, which is the square. Uh, I love this shape and I learned over the, the years that I'm not the only one to love it. Not just because it's nice, but because there's something in our brain that basically connects this shape to the architect archetypical concept of brick. So, with this shape, it's easy to think that we can build something out of it, with it. By looking at this image, you might say, hold on a second, I, I know this guy. This is a gigantic pixel. And, well, of course. <laughs> uh, you might think this is something that is trivial, but actually is kind of a novelty because um, a few years ago, uh, well, not actually a few years ago, I am much older than that. I gather to remember that. Uh, roughly 15 years ago, 20 years ago, CRT monitors were displaying pixels in a really blurry way. So we couldn't rec recognize the actual shape of each pixel. In fact, at the time, uh, pixels were considered like dots, not squares. With, with LCD monitors and high definition screens, the pixels basically regained their shape, the original shape, which is the square, and of course, their design attributes. Um, why am, am I talking about squares, shapes, and stuff like that? Because, as I was saying, a simple and single shape, like a square, alone, doesn't mean anything. But if you arrange several squares, squares into a, a group, you obtain an information. And this is really important for pixel artists, because if you manage these groups, of pixels, you are creating the correct information. And these groups of pixels, well, we pixel artists call them clusters. A cluster is basically a group of pixels with the same color and the same function. So uh, I'm gonna use a lot of sprites from, the, from Japanese video games. And this is a basic example to explain uh, what clusters are. So for instance, if you see the brownish pixels at the top, shaped that way, they build the hair. Uh, a line of pixels will shape the mouth, and etc., etc. If you want a more practical way to understand what a cluster is, think of stencils, if you know what they are. A sheet of paper with a silhouette pierced through it, if you spray um, colors of the, the silhouette, you basically transfer that silhouette to a certain surface. And clusters and stencils basically work the same way. Each stencil and each cluster gather information. If you stack the information on top of each other, you <coughs> create an image with a certain meaning. It is important to manage clusters because if you change even just one pixel in a cluster, you can change the information provided. So, in this case, I tried to push around just one pixel over the face of the, uh, the dude from Crash and the Boys. 
And as you can see, you can change dramatically the expression with just one pixel. This is um, retro, retro uh, sprite, it's not new, but this applies also to uh, modern uh, age pixel art. Uh, here you have a cute monster from this guy, yeah? and as you can see, clusters um, need to be managed even on more complicated images. But in this case, you need to consider uh, also pixels that are surrounding the cluster. In this case, you need to consider those pixels that basically smooth the cluster. But why is, is cluster control so important? Cluster control is important, yes, because if you change just a few pixels over your image, you, you may change the information you are providing. But knowing, clus knowing clusters and uh, knowing how to manage them means also you can find the real scope of your design and learn that less is more. By this I'm saying that if you, if, if you create a design, you need to understand the scope of your design and don't overdo, because overdoing over the information you're trying to push is probably going to do more harm than good. So by this I'm not saying do not experiment or do not enough to finish your artwork. But what I'm saying is just know when to stop. This is really important and I can't stress this enough. Uh, I'm probably going to use my Jedi powers over you in order to remember this. Uh, and I will show you why this is important and how this relates to cluster control. When, uh, I, I would love to, I would love to explain you how to draw with pixels. But I thought that maybe the best idea was to uh, explain you what not to do while mm, painting with pixels. Basically, you need to avoid all the features that prevent readability over, over your clusters uh, by resulting with bending, bad anti-aliasing, pillow shading, the so-called pillow shading, and jagged lines. There are so, some more mistakes that you can make while pixeling, but these are a bit more advanced. I'm gonna explain just these four, which are the, the basic to start with. Bending, okay, bending it's, happens when you basically have two clusters that align in a certain way that highlights the pixel grid they are on. And by doing so, you put the focus of the image on the grid and not on the cluster. So you are basically hiding your information. I know this image might not be the best to show bending, but I wanted to put something cute in the talk. Uh, so here you have Pokemon. Um, probably the most visible uh, bending happens here on the hair. You see those two lines? Those two lines are basically two clusters aligning. You have the cluster shaping the shadow of the hair and the outline. By doing that, you basically hide the fact that there is a curve. So you need to remove pixels, do less, and therefore more, because you will have a smoother curve. Of course, bending can become quite nasty if you don't, con don't control it. In fact, uh, okay, there, there's low contrast here, but these are actually three lines of uh, pixels, which basically uh, want to be want to look like a gradient, but they don't really look like a gradient. They look like noise. They, the the, uh, the human eye reads it like noise. Another way of getting bending, 
of course, in this image I can move <coughs> okay. Uh, well, it's really subtle. Um, basically, there's an outline going uh, around this cluster here, which uh, that hugs the central cluster, and by doing so, it's aligning each step of pixels to that cluster. Uh, I know the contrast is not helping me here, but trust me on that one. Okay, another mistake that my... Oh. Okay, here, okay, this one it works. Uh, another mistake that you might do uh, with pixel art is doing too much anti-aliasing. We know that anti-aliasing is basically an algorithm, a filter that helps to smooth surfaces, lines, or graphics in general. Uh, with pixel art, you have to put each pixel each, each, in each pixel by your hand. And if you overdo this, you will end up with a nasty result that washes out color and doesn't let you understand what the, the shapes of the clusters are. So, once, once again, less is more. Of course, you can do not enough, but in these two cases, I always prefer to get to the first result, which might be um, still a bit jaggy, but at least it's not uh, bleeding. Another mistake that you might do, this is, is the more apparent one, uh, is the so-called pillow shading. Uh, shading an image is really important because it helps to um, create three-dimensional uh, images with their own depth. Pillow shading is basically happens when uh, basically, you have a, a cluster, a central cluster, showing the highlight of a surface, and then all the shades basically uh, gradually uh, come out of, from the first one. This is not really good because basically what you do, you are flattening your image, and you are considering your image like uh, a blob that needs to be filled rather than having shapes that basically build a face, for, like in this case, or whatever. So, always remember to consider the light source and the clusters, and the, each information must uh, relate to the, powers, to the light source or um, the position of the character or whatever. Another mistake that you might find in pixel art are jagged lines. Uh, most of the time, uh, when we think of drawing, we think like we place a pen on the paper and then we do a gesture and we get a line. This doesn't really work for pixel art because most of the time you will end up in a noise or a bumpy line. The only way to prevent this uh, error is to use sequences and um, repetitions. So, for instance, if you want to get a straight line, a 45 degrees straight line, you create a staircase of pixels uh, on which each step has one pixel. <coughs> then you have the 26 degrees um, line with uh, two pixels per step. If you want to do lines in the middle or odd lines, you just start creating repetitions and sequences. Like in this case, you create this staircase with a repetition of one, one, two pixels, one, one, two pixels, etc., etc. Because this is because if you don't create a repetition, what you will end up is this case in which a straight line suddenly has a bump at a certain point. And sequences and repetitions also work for curves. I'm using here a really um, easy to get 
mathematical sequence, but by following this sequence, you might find simpler to create smooth curves without any bumps of any sort. Um, I went through really rapidly these mistakes, but after explaining and parsing these mistakes, I gotta confess you something. I lied. <laughs> these are not actually mistakes. They are a bad way of approaching to pixel art. More, more experienced pixel artists use these errors to create effects. As I was saying before, bad anti-aliasing, for instance, uh, washes out and blurries colors. What, what if you want to actually create a blurry image? You relate to those, to, to these mistakes. So, why the fuss? Basically, <coughs> knowing these mistakes, knowing what clusters are, how important is cluster control, helps you out uh, when approaching that pixel art. Not only if you're an, uh, you're an amateur, but even if you are experienced, by starting with the knowledge that you have to avoid certain mistakes, you try to uh, create more simple shapes, and of course, you will end up with better designs. But this uh, talk is not just for pixel artists, it is for artists in general, because if you know how clusters work, the concept of clusters work, you know that by blocking in, in a certain way your illustration, you will have a, a simpler and better design. So basically you start from scratch, you create the basic uh, shapes on which you build your design, and then you end up with an information, a clear information. If you are a concept artist and you, let's say, start from scratch and start putting things on the paper without any know-how, and then you build something on top of it, then you remove something, you cripple there, and then you end up in something that is not really readable and doesn't provide a clear information. One of, of the worst things that uh, an artist, a game artist, may, may hear from a viewer, from a player, is that by watching this artist going like, what is that? Is, is that a duck or a robot? So by starting from scratch, building your artwork on simple uh, shapes, you will, be, you will have better design and avoid the dark robot situation. But this, uh, how many artists are here? Is there anyone doing graphics? One, okay. <laughs> so, this talk was, what's your, what's your name? Noel. Okay, Samuel, this talk was for you only. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, of course, of course. This talk is also about people uh, who manage uh, a project and uh, manage the timing of a project. Because knowing what art means and how it is built, it helps also to understand how to um, structure a project. By knowing what uh, means for an artist to create a visual language is not just placing lines on a digital canvas. This will help uh, the producer, for instance, to understand the, the time that is spent over creating a visual language. And of course, that you can't really tell an artist, this doesn't look good. And yes, well, I'm really bad at closing my talks, so I, ju I just remember you that the notion of less is more is really important. And as always, I like to close my talks with um, a quote, which helped me to transition out 
this really awkward moment. It's a quote by Bruce Lee. Like everyone else, you want to learn the way to win, but never to accept the way to lose. To learn defeat is to be liberated from it. As I was saying before, less is more doesn't mean that you don't have to do enough or you don't have to experiment. What Bruce Lee is trying to say to us is that comfort zones make you dull. Even if you don't do art, even if you don't do pixel art, just try to understand and maybe try to draw something in your life. Because at the end of the day, even if you try and fail, you will just create something new and useful for your knowledge. Thank you very much. I can offer you a beer. Okay, we're happy. It's a bit trouble with the microphone, maybe. Because I'm. Too much. Yeah? Too? You're too okay. loud. Okay. Um, any question from the audience on the talk? Anyone? Hello? Even about my trip this morning. Yeah. Train Italia is really bad. <laughs> so, can you hear me? Uh, my question is a bit more on the cultural side, I think. In the latest years, we've seen like a uh, great number. You work for them. Okay. Uh, in the latest years, we've seen a great number of pixel art uh, games, uh, even more than high quality games. Uh, I think they're very much more focused on the gameplay and the story instead of just graphics, which was the trend of the last, I don't know, 20 years maybe, 10 years. Uh, do you think that's because like we have too much and now we're starting to go back to the basics and enjoying things that maybe are more important for the player than just for the eyes? Or it's because we don't really know where to push the high fidelity graphics with all the resources we have? Um, those two options are both true in a way, but I would like to add something on top of it, which is uh, pixel art, in a way, it's a medium, an artistic medium. And like all artistic mediums, uh, you can't really exclude an artistic medium from the tool belt of a, an artist. Like, uh, think of, um, I, I heard so many people say that pixel art is retro, is about nostalgia and whatever, but it's not really like that. Uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, no, th th there were no pixel artists at the time, uh, um, some dude created camera that takes pictures and all of a sudden people were saying okay painting is over we're not going to do painting we are going to do photographs now and then you have two other guys creating uh, movie pictures and then all of a sudden okay cameras are over uh, now let's all have videos but it's 2018 and you have paintings uh, photographs, cinema, the same way uh, game art works. Uh, you have pixel art, you have vectors, you have 3D. We haven't stopped making pixel art because of 3D. It's just another uh, art way of expressing art. Of course, the, there are a lot of um, reasons why people choose pixel art for making video games. One of these is, is accessible and uh, production cost is really low. But in order to obtain uh, a good level of pixel art, you need knowledge and you need people that do this kind of talk. And, and listen to them. <laughs> Any more questions? 
hello. Um, after all these years in <laughs> in the uh, video game industry or visual art industry, uh, or generally in in the, in the, in, the, in, the, in the sector of uh, of art, what uh, is uh, your judgment upon the Italian situation? Uh, well. I forgot to say something at the beginning of uh, this talk, uh, something that I really cared about. Uh, when I was showing you some of the um, titles of the games I worked on, I forgot to mention that there were a few games that were developed by uh, Italian team de uh, developers. And I'm pretty proud to say that I work with them and because I like to support Indies, and if you support Indies as well, I suggest that because happiness will come to your life. Um, but apart from this introduction that I forgot, uh, the Italian situation, I think that uh, art-wise, the Italian um, video game developer community is incredible. I, I love some, a lot of the artists that are working in the industry at the moment. I love how uh, Ovosonico uh, decided to follow a certain path uh, over a visual concept which works really well for him. Um, I personally know people from 34 Big Things from Turin and they are amazing artists. I, I think that the level of art in Italy is so high that we don't have to envy anything from other uh, countries, other industries. Uh, if you are asking about pixel art in Italy, I think that there are a lot of good pixel artists, uh, but it's still a movement that it's, it's not at its peak. Uh, because uh, a lot of people want to use Unity. You are going to have a talk about Unity. And uh, there's still people that don't have the right know-how on how to manage pixel art over Unity, which is not a bad thing or a possible thing. But some people get scared by that. Uh, it is possible. You can do that. Probably that's, that's one of the reasons Unity is the most used tool in Italy for developing video games. And probably most of the people try to start by doing 3D rather than uh, pixel art. Did I answer to your question? Any more questions? I do have one otherwise. Um, what, were, what were you born like? Were you like a graphic designer? Um, UI designer, something like a gamer or whatever, become, before becoming a pixel artist. And the second question is, um, how do you generally process your designs? Do you sketch on paper before you start totally digital? Uh, what is your workflow or process? <coughs> okay, uh, well, I started as a, well, I studied pedagogy. Uh, I, I haven't uh, an history as an artist. I started drawing and doing graphics uh, when I was 16 years old. And then I ended up uh, working in several studios that were doing uh, graphics for marketing. So I was basically doing logos and web pages and stuff like that. And then the... Um, the Museum of Science and Technology of Milan uh, saw, uh, saw some of my pixel art and decided to ask me to do a, a video game for the museum. And after that, uh, a Japanese developer called me to redo a game about Outrun. And after that, another guy, another guy. Uh, basically, I started doing pixel art because I just liked that. And <laughs> It ended up being my uh, <laughs> career after that point. Uh, yes, but I started as a, a graphic designer when I was really young. Uh, as for my pipeline, my 
process of creating graphics? Well, it depends. Uh, sometimes I start from uh, a sketch on paper or even on a digital cam canvas on Photoshop. And then uh, from that as a reference, uh, I don't uh, pixel on top of that. As a, as a reference, I start pixeling and creating my image. But for uh, video game development, most of the time, uh, I'm, I, I just get my hands dirty right away. Like, you have to draw... Um, I worked on the uh, video game uh, with Bud, Bud Spencer and Terence Hill. They told me you have to create um, the Western scene inside the saloon. I watched the mood board and some references started pixeling right away. No sketches, no, no anything. It, it depends. It depends if you have time or uh, if you don't. Any more questions? Uh, another big applause for our speaker. There's going to be some, some drinks a bit later. Uh, three minutes of break uh, before the second talk. You can go to the bathroom, you can go and leave a donation, you can go grab a beer or just chill. Uh, we start at 10 with the second talk. Non c'è tempo di stare guardando, non so. Eh? Ok. Saluta. Ah, grazie. Per la terza che ho oggi. Ma io capisco bene che c'è il denaro. Però qua c'è il denaro. Prima la chiesta.
Please take a seat. Please take a seat. Guys, 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 sit down, sit down. Okay. For the second talk of the night, no one but two speakers. No one but two speakers. Giovanni and Massimo. Leave the word to you. So, everybody, it's so nice to be here again. Actually, I was here on the very first event of Spec and Tech and there were way less people, and so today it's gonna to be harder. But it's so nice to see that this community is always so, so big. So today it's me and, uh, and Massimo presenting our talk on uh, a small introduction on uh, how you can do uh, networking over Unity. So we heard that you want to develop a multiplayer video game, and if you don't, please try to imagine so. You know already how to develop a video game, so you're basically using Unity, even for pixel art, even if it's really difficult. And uh, now you want to bring it on the, on the web. Good, let's do this. So, when you develop a, a multiplayer video game, you basically need to do one thing. It's just one. Synchronizing things. So, you need to have things synchronized, possibly in real time, if you're doing a real time video game. And uh, yeah, there was a, a way of doing it in the past. Uh, actually, I'm uh, basically, I started out as a C++ coder. So uh, I went back to C and I Googled for a simple socket example, how to send data over the web. So this can be quite long just to send one byte of data or as many as you want. You have to manage yourself the errors uh, the packets, and uh, yeah, basically everything. Who are you talking to, uh, setting up the connection, and everything else. So it's a lot of work. Fortunately, we are using Unity, so we have Unity to the rescue. Unity provides us uh, with a different network stack, so this is from their official documentation, and uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, upside down, because we have the low-level API on the top, and then going down, we are going up on the stack. And basically, the example from before was at this level. So uh, sending messages uh, like raw packets on the, on the internet. And now we can start working on the other part of the stack, which is easier, of course, and sometimes gives you less control, but is enough for us. And then on top of this, we have our own scripts. So actually our game, we already developed the game. We just want to, to take it to the web. And for this, uh, I'll add the words to Massimo, and yeah. Okay, so now comes the difficult part, because uh, the past is in the past, so now we have to handle the theme in, uh, in R at the moment. So uh, let's uh, configure our uh, scene, our, uh, um, our setup to get started with the networking. So uh, this is a screenshot from Unity. We have uh, the hierarchy with, uh, with about a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, we have uh, uh, two scenes uh, in this uh, new scenario. We have uh, uh, the lobby, which, uh, we, in which we configure stuff and we get ready to play. And then we have the game scene, which is uh, where the play, the game happens. 
so uh, we have our network manager in our lobby, and uh, we have to configure it uh, with a bunch of, uh, of settings. So the most important one is uh, setting the right scenes. So basically, you have to tell which is the lobby scene and which is the game scene. And this is pretty straightforward, and you find it in the docs also. And uh, then, uh, as we can see, you can add this component, which is a network manager hub which uh, is a nice tool to, for prototyping and uh, gives you this uh, ni nice menu to, to get started doing stuff like uh, creating a host, uh, attaching a client, and this stuff. So the, uh, the part uh, then is uh, actually syncing syn the state and uh, putting the stuff uh, working in uh, real time. I give the word back to Joan. So this was the basic setup, and now we need to basically see, sync the state, so send some messages. Uh, we already did ba the basic setup. Uh, uh, this preview screen is basically uh, creating the connection, so one of the, of the um, uh, players playing will be the host, which is our server. And uh, we have some other clients, so we have up to n clients. And the way Unity manages this is that he ha it has a, a copy of it, each object, in every of its clients. So if you are running the game, you're basically adding a copy of everything, so even the other players in the game. Uh, but then you can just control your own player, like uh, the first one, which is the server, and client one uh, is controlling the player one, then we have client two controlling player two, and client n controlling player n. Uh, of course, you need to, this is where the, the actual part of syncing needs to happen. So. We want to sync Unity specific objects, so position, rotation, animation of objects in the, in the space, and the simple variables from our scripts, so uh, integer, flows, anything that represents like the state of the player, so I don't know, the ammunition, the health, everything else. Um, from these simple variables, we can also uh, build up uh, uh, other classes, but just with these simple uh, types. So, uh, another screen from Unity. Uh, we have this network identity, which is a really important part because it assigns uh, a unique ID on the object on the network. So when we will talk uh, to the other clients on the network, we will always agree that one object is unique. Uh, it is uniquely identified by this ID. And then uh, we can see that we have, for, for those of you who are familiar with Unity, you already know the transform. It sets the position, the rotation, and the scale of an object. And then to simply put it on the, on the web, we just need to add another component, which is a network transform. We set up a couple of things, so what needs to be sent and how often, and that's it. Basically, we have done uh, a way of synchronizing the basic state of, uh, of Unity objects. So if a player N is moving, it sends the uh, information to the server, which then sends the information to each of, uh, of its clients. This is cool. Can we do it also for some more variables? Well, yes, we can. And Massimo will show you in just one moment. Okay, so let's get to the code. Uh, basically, you can see uh, we, we can declare a variable as synced by putting this attribute, which is a sync var. Uh, do you see the stuff up there? <coughs> Some of you. Uh, okay, so uh, now this is from our demo we have um, prepared for the night. So basically, we want to um, sync the color of the players. Uh, okay, well, which is the deal? Basically, we want the player to press the space button, then ask the server to, uh, for a new random color, the server decides it, and then send it to all the, all the clients, all the instances of all the, the players around the world, uh, because we want to see the same game, basically. Uh, okay, so we declare it as a sync bar, and it's a color. This is not uh, complex. Okay. Uh, the sync bar attribute, as I said, uh, tell, uh, checks on the server when the value changes, and when it changes, it just sends uh, the update to all the clients. So basically, you don't have to worry about that. You, ju you just have to remember to put the attribute. Another thing to remember is that the update 
uh, app is only from, ser from server to the clients. So if you want to change the information on the client, we will see later how to do it because it's not that straightforward. Okay, so stitch sync uh, can happen not only you know, for variables like color, but also for more complex stuff. So we have basic types, as I said, like integer strings and this stuff. We have unity types, vector free, and all the things you can find in the doc, basically. Then serializable objects, which uh, means that uh, if you describe the object as a set of the properties above, you're, you're fine, you can go on. Then we have also structs, just because we love all programming, so we, we love objects and structs the same way. And then we have also a bonus, which is a list made of primitive types that are listed above. So basically, you can access to the class sync list, and this thing handles the, the fact that you can synchronize lists of, object, of, list of objects. Okay, now we have uh, another tool, uh, which are commands and RPC to uh, do more complex stuff, because uh, as we saw uh, previously, we can just synchronize from server to client in uh, that way. So I leave uh, Giovanni this talk. Okay. So here, uh, we have commands uh, that need to be sent from the clients to update the state on the server, because as Massimo said, just the server can flow just from the server down to the clients. So, uh, this is the flow. So from the server you synchronize to each copy of uh, the object in, it, in each one of the clients. And uh, if you need to, uh, sorry for the code, it's too small. And sorry for the stuff before our designers are on vacation. So we tried to do our best, but... <laughs> okay, so uh, we want to uh, send some comments, as we said, to the server. Uh, for those of you who can't read, uh, basically here we are trying to uh, check for a key pressed space and then we want to tell the server that uh, it needs to change the color. So we have two new concepts here. We have this is local player, which is checking if we are on the, on the correct instance that we can control. So uh, going back, we have like the player one can only be controlled from uh, client number one and client number two can control player number two, and so on. And then we call some code on the server. This is the flow, so from the player two, uh, when it presses space, uh, we can change the color, so we need to send the information to the server. So, the flow is as follows. The, the client asks the server to perform an action, and the code is executed actually on the server. So the part of generating the random code is ex executed only once, only on the server. So this is the, the code executed on the server, as I said. So we are gener generating the color just once and then informing everyone else uh, via the uh, sync var attribute. The RPC uh, work uh, in the opposite way and it's basically the opposite flow. So the server is telling the clients to uh, execute some code and the code is executed on each of the clients. So every copy in every of the clients is ex executing the code. So for example, here we have another example uh, of uh, another script. We want to generate an explosion because explosions are fun. And we want, uh, as, as before, to check if a key is pressed and we want to generate an explosion everywhere because explosions are fun. So uh, here we are, step number one on the client. Check if the key is pressed. If so, send a comment to the server, which is here, server, what you need to do inform all the clients that you need to, step number three, instantiate an explosion on each of the servers. So this is really complicated just to do a single explosion. The real problem with Unity, in fact, is that uh, if you want to have more actions, you need to always uh, uh, have multiple copies of the code, like the code executed on the server and on the client, which needs to stay on the same file. So this is a really straightforward when you do just one action per script, but usually in bigger projects that's not really the case. On the going farther side, like you can do something more. We just wanted to cite one thing, which is uh, sending messages, which are used to send a message from a particular instance of an object to another one. So using uh, directly the network identity and targeting a particular object. So 
This can be used, uh, for example, to uh, bypass the local authority and to uh, basically uh, talk directly to another object without involving the server or the objects on the other clients. Yeah, because sometimes you don't want to send information to all, uh, to all the instances. If maybe you have to do some error checking, like uh, a client, uh, a client for a bit uh, shuts down and then uh, reconnects, uh, then you want to send updates uh, only to this client and not sending all, uh, to all the clients the stuff, because you are just killing your network and basically your game will suck. Okay, so as we said this, now it is the weighted demo time. So we built a small game, it's called The Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, have you ever heard of it? No, actually we didn't, we couldn't use the title, so we went to the Beta Scrolls, Skyrim. And we're gonna do a small demo here. Wanna be Skyrim. You built a lot of hype about uh, this demo. Yes. What's the objective? Okay, so here we have two exact copies of our game. And um, like I built this volcano today, so please give it up and uh, so <laughs> as you can see as you can see, as we said, we already have a small UI provided by Unity, and we decide that one of the two um, players let's imagine that this is executed on two different computers actually because otherwise it doesn't really make sense. And a little thing is that uh, all the stuff we told you now, it's valid in any architecture you choose for your game, but uh, our examples are made uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer way. So basically, uh, maybe the one on the left uh, will be uh, the host, which means uh, it will be the server and also a client. So basically, he will run also the, uh, the code of the server and the code of the client, uh, which can seem like a super mega feature, yeah, it will be super useful, but it will uh, just hide a lot of bugs then will show up uh, later and you will cry, basically. <laughs> okay, so we have the host ready on the left and then we can add another client. We could add up to uh, as many as we wanted clients, but like it's easier to just see it from two. So we have the two players, which are the small capsules there and we can move them around. If I move one, you can see that uh, the movement is synchronized on uh, the other one. And this one was done with the basic objects we talked to before, so the network uh, transform from Unity. So this is like the simplest thing to do. And then when we press space, we can change the color. And yeah, it's synchronized on, on every client. And I think, uh, for doing this, like the basic movement seems like super easy, but uh, uh, we use uh, already a, a concept, a useful concept, which is the one uh, uh, in the if statement, uh, which was uh, is local player. Uh, meaning that uh, if we don't use this uh, condition, uh, we will just be moving uh, the two things together, playing uh, the, the, the keys, basically. Uh, so we check uh, uh, with the is local player which one of the two windows and which one of the two instances around the world is uh, pressing the buttons, and we do the movement. And as for our third and final feature for this demo, we have explosions, as promised. So we have explosions, <laughs> and we can generate as many of them moving around. <laughs> That's basically our small uh, we have uh, uh, all the source code here on the stage, so please uh, ask us questions. So we are happy to to tell you everything you want to know, and we know as well. Okay, so that was basically our small introduction. And if you have any questions, please come to us. And, yeah. Explosions. Question. Can, can I move the player outside of the box? Can I move the player outside of the box? Can I see? Can I, can I see the player? Can I move the player outside of the bounding box? 
No, because there were really high mountains, didn't you see that? That's why it was high. There were high mountains and uh, a volcano on the back. And some of them were also invisible uh, tricks. Can I move it inside the, the volcano? Yes, you can. <laughs> Probably you is the main quest of the game. Does you survive? Yeah, because there's no head, so basically you can. Serious questions? Can you exit from the volcano? <laughs> can I make it explode? Can I explode the volcano? Questions? Serious ones? Come on. Okay. Have you, have you ever used a new system using multiplayer? And if yes, is better of older system of LAN or create own server for multiplayer games? Okay, uh, we are using these uh, technologies in our latest game which, uh, with, uh, which uh, we are developing at the moment. Uh, and uh, all the stuff you saw uh, was made uh, with the latest technologies uh, provided by Unity. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to go a bit uh, down into the stack of technologies we saw at the beginning, but, but to fix some problems and just to uh, do more cool things and optimize stuff. But basically, we didn't never go down, down, down to the C++ level of this stuff. Uh, mainly because we are doing this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, thing because uh, in the project we are working now. So doing peer-to-peer -peer is uh, this is the easiest way because if we go to an authoritative server model, we have to build a separated server, and maybe in uh, this situation could be uh, more efficient building a, a separated system. But uh, for uh, our resources and also our skills, because we are getting into this uh, right now, we we stay with the new technologies. And also, we tried to run a server-only instance of these ones, and we got some results. But we were too much on the peer-to-peer -peer thing to, to not have too many bugs to fix, basically. Like, like with Unity, you can build your own server, like execute an instance of, uh, of Unity without the renderer, so you can also do the alternative server uh, way, so without having the peer-to-peer -peer method. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> More questions? Don't worry, people. Wait for the spec, so. <laughs> You're forced to make questions. Yeah. Oh, look at this beautiful teacher. Please stand up. <laughs> hey. Is, is it easy to prevent cheating on uh, this uh, uh, with this method? Uh, I, I don't understand. It's a, I, I can reply to you. Uh, he was asking if, if it's easy to prevent cheating from the players with this system. No. So <laughs> no, it's not easy, and this is the wrong way of doing it. Like it's the most basic way, as you see. Uh, the the movement was synchronized directly from the client to the server without any control. So if uh, a client got hacked. Uh, you can easily move the player from the point A to the other side of the map without anyone noticing, basically. Of course, you can build something to prevent this. So, uh, for instance, you can move the player uh, and check if it, if, it, if it moved too fast or yeah, uh, if it's disconnected and then reconnected in another place. Uh, so you can do something, but uh, Unity out of the box doesn't provide much help on doing so. So you do, you, you'll have to code it yourself. And for the cheating thing, uh, you can maybe think that, okay, we run all the stuff on the server, and this could be a solution for cheating, but not a solution for having a lot of players, because uh, basically you have uh, some latency times between clients and servers, the ping. So you cannot run everything on the server. You have to do some prediction on your client, but, have, but if you do it uh, in a smart way, you can uh, provide uh, a good experience to your, uh, to your uh, users and uh, have a smooth system. Or, uh, and you can also add some uh, um, protections on your server, like for the movement on the server, you can check if it has moved too much, and so you maybe you do something to, to handle this, basically. Any more questions?
questions? Just one quick question about ping. Uh, considering that it's peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, I suppose that the host is kind of faster also as a client. Is there a native way, or at least non-native, but with the multiplayer system to balance the ping between the host client that's for the base and the other clients, or do you have to do by end? It would be a dream. <laughs> No, like from a technical point of view, uh, there's not much you can do, like you communicating with yourself, so it's way easier. On the other hand, you, you have to consider that uh, the server is executing code for everyone, so usually is more loaded, and so it has to perform more tasks in the same time, so these two things usually balance out themselves. Uh, but of course, if you have a ping of 500 milliseconds, and yeah, of course you can't compete with that. And the, the server will, op will always be uh, updated earlier. So you can do something, but yeah, it's more like a game design decision than a technical decision. And basically, this is the this is why uh, people uh, there are schools for for teaching how to create video games or there are workshops to teach people how to make video games because moving things is easy and doing a great product that works uh, is uh, no cheatable, uh, it has uh, good responses, it implies a lot of work and a lot of skills and technical uh, knowledge. So basically you guys, if you want to develop a game, uh, study. Thank you. Okay, if you don't have any more questions, I would say a big applause for our speakers. Right before wrapping up, we have three important announcements. First one, we already have next event. <laughs> Second one, it is already this month, on the 24th of May. Third one, goes abroad, because the event will be held in parallel in Germany. In Munich. So we're gonna go conquer Europe uh, with uh, an Italian flag and a uh, piece of spec on our car. Uh, so you will see it's gonna be fun. Uh, thanks a lot for being here tonight. As always, uh, a lot of uh, very nice faces, a lot of new faces, a lot of old faces following us from the first uh, edition of Spec Attack. Um, what we ask you before wrapping up and uh, before welcoming you to the next edition of Spec Attack is to give us a bit of help in uh, stacking all the chests. If you can, this green one can be closed this way, and you just put them next to the to the to the wall. If I just move this thing with my S. So we can, it put them down here. If you have like this one, uh, can you can you make an example? Yeah, thank you. Okay, close them properly. Yeah. 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 You put them here. All the rest, let's get rid of them because we want the spec uh, and the beers here for everyone. Cheers! Thank <laughs> you.